Hello everyone. Welcome to Economics for Everyone Lecture 7. Um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome you back today. This is our last lecture in Block 2 of the course, the block that deals with microeconomics. And I'd like to talk today about government intervention in perfectly competitive markets. I am reminded of a passage in Tim Harford's book, The Undercover Economist, in which he asks us, uh, how should we think about excess profits made by some firms? And he, in particular, cites the example of um, the banking industry. So how should we? Well, um, he being the good economist he is, uh, says it depends. It depends whether the firm is offering us a superior service that we as consumers demand and in fulfilling that demand, that market demand, they um, make much more money than their marginal costs. That's a positive development in his view, and one that signals to the market that if you, that is to say, other potential suppliers offered that service, um, there's a price signal here telling you you should get in here and do it. <laughs> On the other hand, you can see excess profits for reasons that are colloquially described as crony capitalism. You see the Economist magazine using that term. And that is government uh, intervention in the market that stifles its workings and shuffles surplus to the benefits of the few to the detriment of the many. There are some barriers to entry or other imperfections that are capitalized on to create those excess profits. And so we'll talk about this type of uh, rent-seeking behavior as a type of intervention we see in perfectly competitive um, markets. And we're going to use the agricultural support programs that you've examined in your assignment as an example of that. But on the other hand, towards the end of the lecture, we'll also talk about market failures and where private marginal cost, private marginal benefit lead to outcomes that don't reflect social marginal costs and social marginal benefits. Something is missing in the market, uh, something to do with usually um, imperfect property rights, that leads to a failure. We may end up producing too much or too little of goods. And in those cases where the market failures, fails, there's a rationale for government intervention. And um, I'll briefly illustrate that by, um, by reference to climate change and the consensus around economists to uh, price uh, carbon emissions, for ex example. Now that said, um, I want to thank you for uh, submitting your assignments to me um, yesterday. That's much appreciated and it's helped me to frame this lecture. And um, I always little, feel a little bit more comfortable um, uh, speaking to you because in my mind's eye I still see you uh, in, <laughs> uh, in the classroom sitting around the table. So welcome Mary Beth and Robert and along the back row um, Vikram and, and George and Osvaldo and Manju and of course uh, sitting around the table Antoinette, uh, Donna, uh, Vince and of course Sana and Sam. Uh, welcome to this last lecture uh, in um, microeconomics. I'm not only impressed with your uh, energies in getting the assignment done and submitted to me, um, but also in your engagement on the uh, website. I didn't uh, realize it, but it's actually quite good to have a record of that engagement and, 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 and a reference. Uh, 
So I encourage you to read the comments, questions, and concerns that have been posted. I've tried to respond to all of them, and so now we have a written record of these things that you can um, refer back to if that's of any help um, uh, to you. There is one question I didn't respond to, and I will address it uh, in the introductory part of this lecture. So now this is what we've been up to. Just to recap, we're developing a model to understand uh, prices and quantities in a particular market structure, the perfectly competitive market. We've chosen that because that is an important refer reference case in economic theory, uh, and it leads to uh, desirable outcomes. We've summarized those in the two welfare theorems, that perfectly competitive markets lead to efficient outcomes in the sense of being Pareto efficient. And, um, and uh, this way of thinking makes a sharp division between efficiency and fairness. We might not appreciate um, the uh, outcome uh, in the sense that it doesn't fulfill our sense of social justice or social values or, or fairness, um, but with appropriate rejigging of uh, property rights through lump sum taxation, we can reach any um, efficient market outcome. So the theory <laughs> uh, tells us. Uh, but we're not just interested in theory, we're interested in confronting the theory with facts and with informing public policy. And so that's why we've been applying our model to commodity markets, um, which arguably are um, perfectly competitive in some sense. Um, and today we're going to focus on public policy directed to producers in these markets. And sometimes um, these policies are seen as an example of the type of rent-seeking behavior that negatively influences outcomes for the broad society, but promotes the private interests of some. And as I said, we'll um, also talk about different kinds of interventions um, that are meant to correct uh, market failures mostly around uh, what's called externalities, but also in the provision uh, of other goods. So here's a picture. I took it from the Twitter feed of uh, Wojciech Kocik, who uh, teaches economics at Columbia, and he's playing the undercover economist um, a couple of weeks ago at, la at least as the uh, as the unfortunate circumstances in New York were starting to unfold, he noticed, as I'm sure you do now, um, uh, empty shelves in his uh, local uh, store. Uh, in particular, he's talking about, a, uh, he's taking a picture of a, uh, a certain type of cleaner that uh, has been in high demand. One store in which he sees the shelves empty and another in which they're fully stocked. Duane Reed on the left um, adjusts prices only slowly. There could be frictions in price adjustments. Uh, and on the right, you have the picture in a small independence store where uh, prices have gone up and there's also a certain amount of quantity rationing going on uh, as well. And the shelves are there. So what's going on in these uh, markets? Um, and that, in fact, is sort of the uh, question that uh, Donna raised in uh, one of her comments on, uh, on the website uh, in response to the last lecture. Right now, consumers are clearing the shelves at grocery stores everywhere. And there's a type of hoarding uh, going on. So let's analyze uh, that. I don't want to bring in the, um, the word sati satiation here, which is sort of the latter part of the question. I used that word in the last lecture to, to motivate our understanding of diminishing marginal utility in the consumer's uh, mind. But let's think more in terms of what's happening in the market, what determines demand, and how uh, demand is changing. So here we have our perfectly competitive market. The uh, downward sloping curve, the uh, line, the blue line, is the demand curve. And the upward sloping red line is the supply curve. And I've just realized how insensitive I continue to be to people who happen to be colorblind. 
and I'm sorry for that. So please send me an email if you um, have color blindness with suggestions on colors that are more appropriate for you. But if you see a downward sloping line, that is the uh, demand curve. If you see an upward sloping line, that's a supply curve. Um, and we have an equilibrium in this market of P star and Q star. All right. Now, the total cost of producing this good is the area under the supply curve. Remember, the supply curve is, if you will, a type of marginal uh, cost curve. If you add up all these incremental marginal costs, you get total costs. Okay. The um, total benefits to the consumer are given by the area underneath the demand curve. That's their marginal benefit curve. And if you add up all of those incremental marginal benefits, you get a total benefit. The difference between total benefit and total cost is the area of this triangle. And that's the social surplus. And it gets split between consumers and producers according to where the market equilibrium settles. At P star, this part goes to producers, and this part of the surplus goes to consumers. Now, I should say that this is a market demand curve. It's the horizontal summation of all of our individual demand curves. So each individual at each of these prices has a certain amount of quantity that he or she will consume. Add up all of those quantities and you get the market demand curve. That's not to say that cons consumers are, are the same. In fact, they're very different. So consumers in this part of the market demand curve might be those with a very strong preference for this commodity, which determines their higher willingness to pay. Or people who have very high incomes and uh, uh, are a little bit less constrained in, in their behavior. People in this end are going to be uh, uh, people with uh, people who don't have as strong preferences or perhaps lower uh, lower incomes. So there's a type of surplus that comes from being able to purchase the commodity at the market price. People up here had a much higher willingness to pay. They would have paid more than P star, but they end up paying P star and they reap this surplus, which we call a consumer surplus. Okay? And the idea that um, there is this surplus there certainly motivates a lot of marketing and other practices in, um, in, um, uh, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, so that's why information is so important. Um, the imprint you leave online through your engagements in social media and your shopping uh, behavior is collected, aggregated, and sold to um, create um, predictions of your willingness to pay. Um, that's why, for example, seats on an airplane are sold at different prices. They are certainly segmented by class, um, first class, business class, economy class, because some consumers, businesses, have a higher willingness to, to pay and will put people into higher class seats. They're also sort of sold according to how much time before the flight takes off, because as as we come closer and closer to the departure date, presumably the consumers that are interested in that flight are people who really need to get somewhere and who have higher willingness to pay. And so price adjusts accordingly. And so there are all kinds of mechanisms like that. And certainly getting individual information about you and a very fine sense of your tastes is important to online uh, uh, retailers. All that said, though, in perfectly competitive markets, the uh, price is driven to P star, and there's a law of one price in these markets. If there's deviation, 
in the law of one price, we probably know that the market is less than perfectly competitive. The other thing that's important is that this demand curve is drawn in this space, in price quantity space, holding all other things constant. And we talked about those uh, in class. Four broad categories. Certainly tastes and preferences, and generally we take those uh, constant. Uh, incomes also determine quantity demanded, but they're held fixed to draw a given demand curve. The prices of other commodities, particularly um, complements and substitutes. And finally, um, the expectations of future conditions in this market. If we expect prices to be higher or quantity to be restricted in the future, that will increase our demand now. There can also be um, what's, what are called um, bandwagon effects, in which we take into account the behavior of others in this market. So whether or not we anticipate shortages in this market, if, every, if I begin to feel that everyone else anticipates a, sort, sh a shortage, I will increase my demand now. <laughs> so this is the situation that we're seeing in some uh, cases. If our original demand curve was here and the equilibrium was price was P, and we expect in the future for that price to rise, our demand for the commodity now increases. It shifts up. If we expect everyone else to be buying more of that commodity uh, in the future, and we don't, ex uh, we don't think that supply will come along quick enough, we will begin to buy more now. And so that's why it's important for leaders to manage expectations to, in these times, to develop an assurance that supply lines are intact, that um, there is a, we are all in it together attitude uh, to prevent a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in developing. <laughs> It may well be that supply side, supply side is completely responsive uh, to demand, that stores are in a position to refill uh, those shelves. But if demand increases tremendously in the belief that that's not the case, then in some sense our behavior makes it so. Okay, So what we have here when the demand curve shifts because of future expectations at the going price, this distance here is excess demand. And that's reflected in the picture of empty shelves. Quantity supplied is this much, quantity demanded is this much, everything is gone off the shelf and people are still looking for the commodity. It's also reflected in that picture of rising, um, of rising prices. So in some areas, prices will rise. Whether we call that price gouging or not uh, will, will sort of depend uh, uh, on how we think about fairness and the appropriate way to ration. If the demand curve for this commodity is very inelastic, uh, it's an absolute necessity, then I think we can understand the sense that we are all in it uh, together and that first come first serve might be a more fair way of rationing a given supply than according to who has the highest willingness to pay. Um, and so the point here is to understand future expectations having a bearing on market conditions now even if the supply curve is fixed. And the other related point to that is that um, time is a very important element in all of our modeling. Uh, so we know that with time, supply curves become more elastic, and demand curves also change their elasticities. In short periods of time, the market can't adjust as uh, quickly on the quantity side. So we also always have to keep in mind the dimension of time in our modeling. 
So if you're looking at store shelves day to day, week to week, that's a different thing than looking at them month to month, year to year, or decades to decades. Mm -hmm. So let's continue that discussion of market conditions by talking about a couple examples of rent seeking behavior and in particular uh, the commodity for milk. And I remind you of this picture in which we saw pretty consistent upward trends, trends in the prices of milk in two countries, Canada and the United States, and a lot less variability in milk prices than we saw in coffee prices. So in the coffee market, the price over the decades trended downward and was very variable. And those are, these are both, it would seem on the face of it, perfectly competitive markets. Milk is a perfectly homogeneous commodity just as uh, coffee is. Um, there are large numbers of buyers and sellers in both markets. And there's no presumption of imperfect information, so if information is perfect, why are the outcomes in the milk market so different than in the coffee market? And we're going to suggest that this reflects um, government policy or particular the capturing of government policy to the private benefit of some and to the social de detriment of the broad majority. So here is the uh, question. We're going to examine three different types of programs, quotas, price supports, and deficiency payments. And you're asked to do a comparative statics exercise um, and compare the outcomes uh, before and after the program is introduced. So let's start with quotas, which are an enforceable limit on how much can be uh, sold or supplied uh, in the market. And that limit is expressed by a perfectly inelastic supply curve set at Q. All right. So it's the law, if you will, or some enforcement mechanism that determines the supply. So no matter what the price, the quantity will stay the same. All right. And this is the, the supply curve that producers would like to produce on, but they recognize that it's in their collective interest to limit their uh, supply. And so they need some way of collectively reinforcing that limit. And in the case of domestic um, US and Canadian dairy markets, uh, that limit is a government program. The government assigns a quota to each farm limiting how much it can produce, and that quota adds up to a particular amount that the market can bear at the desired price, P. Now, why is it in the producer's interest to raise the price? After all, the amount that they can sell falls. Well, we know from last day that if the demand is inelastic in this price range, the total expenditures on the commodity will go up. The proportionate increase in price more than compensates for the proportionate fall in demand, and total expenditures, their, the producer's gross revenues, uh, go up. So that's to say, if demand is inelastic in this area, the area of this rectangle, P, times Q will be bigger than the area of this rectangle, P star times Q star. All right? And we wouldn't want to do this if demand is elastic, because then the proportional response in quantity, the fall in revenues that falls from that, would more than compensate for the rise in, in price. That said, while it's in their collective interests to reduce supply, it's not in their individual interests. The ideal situation for any one producer is have all of his or her competitors cut back on supply, uh, but maintain his or her level of production. They can, they can sell more 
and they can sell it at a higher price. So it's important that this be enforceable. Right? And so these quotas are associated with each farm have a value and they get capitalized into the value uh, of, of the farm. We also use this model briefly in class to talk about the uh, taxi market and the value of medallions. So that's the case in which a local go government serves that enforcement uh, uh, mechanism, whereas agricultural commodities are handled at the federal level. This model is also sometimes used to understand the oil market. It's in the collective interest of oil producers to the re restrict their supply and ride up an inelastic demand curve. But here you're now talking about nation states trying to behave collectively, and the enforcement mechanism isn't as <laughs> binding as it is in a domestic policy context. And so what we're seeing now in the dramatic fall in oil prices is the unraveling of agreements um, to uh, restrict supply. Okay. Um, one of the factors behind that is as you elevate supply, uh, as, you, as you elevate price, it, bring, it, it creates incentives for other producers to come online, perhaps higher cost, uh, cost uh, producers who are outside of the agreement, and uh, they can free ride on that higher price. So that's why um, um, uh, uh, more far-flung sources of oil in northern Canada or in the Nordic countries is now or was uh, profitable uh, when OPEC was able to maintain this agreement. But anyways, that's the let's get back to, uh, to milk. You can use this model in a number of different ways. So we're interested in, in comparative statics. That's to say, find the initial equilibrium, P star, Q star, and compare it to the new equilibrium. Price has gone up, quantity, uh, the prices that consumers have to pay and the price that producers receive has gone up. P is greater than P uh, star. The quantity that consumers end up purchasing has gone down. The expenditures of uh, consumers and the gross revenues of uh, the uh, suppliers has gone up because demand is inelastic. Government enforces the uh, agreement, but uh, aside from that, doesn't experience very significant uh, costs in running this program. Over time, the challenge is going to be to be able to continue to enforce that because there's an incentive for others to come into the market. After all, we talked about this little triangle here, this deadweight loss and what economists call it, representing the advantages of exchanges that didn't take place. After all, someone would like to buy this commodity at a lower price and somebody could supply it at an even lower price and yet that exchange isn't permitted. So if you can't, there's always going to be an incentive for someone to get into the market and if you can't enforce that agreement, uh, that's going to be uh, uh, trouble. And so that's what's sort of happening in the uh, taxi market. So to sum up, um, quotas lead to a higher price. This mathematical symbol means P is greater than uh, P star. They reduce the quantity that consumers purchase. Q is less than um, uh, uh, Q star. And the... Um, the incomes of uh, producers is P times Q, which is greater than the initial P star times Q star because demand is inelastic. The government faces a minimal cost. Price supports are a different program. If we want to hit our target price, the other thing we could do is have the government become a purchaser of this commodity. So at price P, consumers will consume Q, producers will want to produce capital Q, there is excess supply. Normally, that would bid the price down, but the government can come in and purchase that excess supply. 
in effect sort of creating an artificial demand for this commodity to sustain the price P. Okay. Now, the price that consumers get is P, and they spend this much on the good. Governments spend P, and they buy this much. Uh, their expenditures are this much. So the total monies going to suppliers are, is now P times Q, which you can see increased over the case of quotas. The difference here, though, is now the government is spending real money. And so the, its costs are higher. And the other thing, to get back, to our discussion of expectations, and, and that's why I thought it was important to begin uh, the lecture with that discussion. It's important that this amount of the good that the government has purchased not come back onto the market. And in fact, if there's an expectation that the government will sell the good at some later date, what do you think will happen? Well, if supply increases in the future, it means prices will fall. Consumers might hold back on purchasing now in order to purchase later. And then it, to maintain this price, the government has to maintain even more uh, or purchase even more. So we have to have very strong expectations that the government stockpiles aren't going to be put onto the market. And so what does the government do with its commodities? Well, sometimes these commodities get dumped into other economies. Uh, sometimes these goods get dumped onto other economies through foreign aid. So um, rice and sugar and other commodities that are produced in the United States uh, often get shunted to other markets. It means a, a good deal of cost for the government. And so you can see in this, in this scenario, there's an incentive to get this qu quantity purchased off the market, out of the market, away somewhere else. Right. Then to summarize here, for price supports, uh, the price has gone up. The quantity purchased by consumers has fallen from the initial equilibrium. It's no different than under quotas, but it's less than they would have bought uh, in a perfectly competitive market. The incomes of, consume, of, of producers has gone up. Now it's P, capital P times capital Q. That's higher than in the initial equilibrium, and it's higher than under quotas. And then the cost of the government is the amount that it buys times the price it buys it at. So this is a more expensive program to run than quotas. Finally, uh, deficiency payments or subsidies. This is a type of price guarantee, as I suggested last day. The government says to the producers, go ahead and produce as much as you would as if the market price was P. Take that and put it on the market and then sell it for whatever you can get. And, and you would read that off the demand curve. The willingness to uh, uh, buy quantity Q on the behalf of consumers is just P. So the producer earns this much from, its uh, from the sale of the commodity. And then the government says, and it all gets sold, and then the government says that we will reimburse you with a subsidy of this much so that your total revenues are as if the price was P. All right? So government expenditures on the good, well, or costs, they're not actually buying the good, uh, is the area of this rectangle. This rectangle represents the expenditures of consumers, and this is the entire amount of money earned by the supplier. So now, the government doesn't have any stockpiles of the good to uh, worry about. It's all sold on the market, but it cuts a check to producers.
this can be also uh, 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 very expensive. But uh, in terms of answering the question, now it's interesting that the price that the consumers get is lower than the initial market e equilibrium. The quantity they consume is higher. Uh, the income of the producers is higher. So there's a win-win here for, for consumers. They're paying less, they're consuming more, and the consumer is getting uh, more money. Uh, and then the cost of the government is the difference in the uh, market price and the supported price times the quantity that that's sold. So these things can be are much more expensive on the government side. So that's an exercise in comparative statics where we take the initial equilibrium, find the the uh, new equilibrium, and compare the outcomes. All right. Now that new equilibrium is not an efficient in, uh, equilibrium. It's there because the producers have captured government policy uh, to their benefit, and in all cases their incomes are higher, but they're, they're much higher than support programs. So if you are uh, an advocate for the producers, you would recommend to them to go after either a price support or a deficiency payment program. Uh, if you knew the exact elasticities of demand uh, and supply and how they varied in the appropriate price range, uh, you could get a better estimate of which uh, revenues would be different. If you were an advocate for the producers, you would lean towards deficiency payments because they're paying a smaller um, um, uh, price. They're consuming more. Uh, the demand curve is inelastic, so at a lower price, they're spending uh, less. So this is clearly a preference to the, uh, uh, the um, consumer. If the government wanted to make all constituencies, um, all constituencies um, um, uh, better off, it would lean to this payment, but at possibly a huge expense that falls on society as a whole. So if you were a social planner, quote unquote, an economist who stood back objectively uh, and looked at this market, which of these programs would you recommend? Well, the answer from one of the assignments is, I think I would tell them to let Mr. Smith's, that is Adam Smith's, invisible hand to do its work. I'm sorry, that's a typo, to do its work and to not interfere. And that's the right answer. <laughs> We've already, we already know as economists that the situation that maximizes the social surplus is the perfectly competitive outcome. All the other outcomes have a cost in efficiency, um, a cost that the individual producers of this commodity don't face, that they push onto society as a whole and in some cases, the consumers of this, of this commodity. But for society as a whole, it's a less efficient outcome. And so what's happening in these uh, two markets? Well, they are highly regulated markets. And um, so even from my knowledge of theory, I can make some predictions of what's going on here, but I would want to actually do some research and explore what government programs are in effect. I know a little bit, but I'm not an expert, but let me make some guesses. Canadian market is, is organized by something called the Dairy Cana Canadian Dairy Commission, and its job is to make demand forecasts and to set a quote list appropriately to, uh, to the benefit of producers. And so that's what's happening in Canada. It's... Um, it's judicious restrictions of supply through quotas that has led to no variability in prices and an upward trend. And these little steps, they don't look like market phenomena to my eye. They are probably points in time where quotas were actually adjusted. In the U.S., the... Um, the programs are more complicated and have evolved through time, but they don't involve quotas. They involve a mixture of subsidies and price supports. 
and in fact some changes in policies in this area uh, so that subsidies come to dominate a little bit more. And so this is why prices uh, have stopped uh, trending up. The other thing that's important though is that the costs of running this program are much higher in the United States for government than they are in Canada. And so that's why in part why um, the dairy market was an issue in the renegotiation of the NAFTA uh, trade deal between these two countries. The U.S. very much wanted access to the Canadian market because its supply is so much greater and growing because it's supporting a higher price through uh, subsidies and it has to get rid of this. Uh, the um, market price of milk is lower but still producers are able to come online uh, and expand production facilities and be more uh, productive and so you want to get access to international uh, markets and this is a big threat for Canada which is sort of restricting supply you've got a very um, strong and vocal constituency that's that's concentrated geographically so carries a certain amount of, 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 of weight in electing members to the government. And they would be under threat if, uh, if um, uh, supply uh, was opened up. And so there's a real political dancing act in trying to square these corners. But it all arises from rent-seeking behavior in this market to the benefit of uh, the producers, the detriment in, 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 in some cases of consumers, uh, but the detriment to the overall uh, efficiency in the market. Now let me talk about market uh, failures, where there is a rationale for government intervention that increases market efficiency. Um, and so we have here our world of truth, uh, a market in equilibrium in which the social surplus is maximized, where individual, rational, maximizing behavior, I am stopping from using words like um, greed, and selfishness, <laughs> uh, uh, but the model is entirely motivated by everyone maximizing their own interests. Mm -hmm. uh, where that type of behavior uh, leads to a socially efficient outcome, a certain beauty to it, but it reflects the fact that this marginal cost curve that individuals face is a social marginal cost curve. And this marginal benefit is a social marginal benefit. And this stems from uh, perfectly defined and properly enforced uh, property rights. Um, well, let me sort of illustrate to you where there can often be a divergence between individual costs and benefits and uh, social costs and benefits. The point here is when any market player behaves in the market, he or she has an influence only to the extent or that influences others only to the extent that it gets wrapped up in market prices in those exchanges. And sometimes activities that we undertake aren't reflected in market prices and that's because they're not traded and property rights aren't perfect. So here's an example. Uh, this chocolate bar which I bought at Trader Joe's when I was uh, in, in, in New York. Uh, it reflects, this chocolate bar does, my purchasing power I uh, worked for some money, I traded some of my time, I had to property rate my time, and I traded it, and I got money. And there's 
a company that supplies chocolate. It offered this at a particular price. And for me, it was uh, worth it to buy this chocolate. Why? Well, as you know, uh, chocolate is a complement to coffee. So coffee and chocolate go well together. And Italy has given us great things. Uh, it's given us a lovely cuisine with high quality and simplicity in its, in, in its recipes. Um, the cappuccino prime amongst them. But good chocolate comes from Belgium, I'm afraid. And if you look carefully at my Trader Joe chocolate, I don't know if you can see it, but it says product of Belgium at the bottom. So I have a particular interest in this chocolate bar. And, you know, it's mine. I bought it and I can do what I want with it. And in particular, I can sit here in my comfortable bedroom and eat this chocolate in front of you. And I can wonder right now how you're feeling. Some of you have seen your welfare go up. You have a certain amount of empathy with me, and you know that I'm happy, so it makes you even happier. So if I want to make you happy, I should eat more chocolate. But when I bought the chocolate bar, the price only took into account marginal cost of reducing this chocolate bar, it didn't take into account the extra happiness that you would get from seeing me eat it. On the other hand, I can appreciate that it's rude to eat in front of people. And that possibly Possibly, just possibly, your happiness is not going up, it's going down. Um, I've distracted you from your studies, I've, uh, I've been rude, and in that sense, the price of the chocolate bar isn't taking into account all of the um, costs that I'm imposing on society in doing that. So enough with chocolate, but you get where I'm I'm going, there's an external cost or an external benefit from some activities that aren't captured in the price. So it says if this supply curve, which reflects private uh, marginal costs, is missing something, and it really should be another supply curve that reflects the total costs that this activity places on society. So you might think of a global warming in these terms. If it was a positive externality, the chocolate giving you a benefit, having seen me watch it, I would have shifted the curve in the other direction. So we have this outcome in the marketplace when the socially optimal outcome should lead to less production and consumption of this good. All right. Now, externalities, um, they come in different kinds. There can be direct producer, producer externalities. These may be technical, where the behavior of one producer actually can make the production uh, of another producer more or less efficient. Uh, so, for example, um, the classic example is a farmer who plants an orchard. Um, that is of ben an orchard that is of benefit to the bee population. The bee population increases and honey production goes up. Yet um, the farmer who's planting his orchard isn't taking into account 
that beneficial side effect that he's having on other producers. We would want him to even plant a bigger orchard, but the market price for his product doesn't reflect that. So they can be a positive or negative, and so pollution is often seen as a negative uh, technical uh, externality. And I've just illustrated with the chocolate bar, and excuse me for that, um, uh, I've just illustrated that externalities can work also from consumers to consumers. Uh, but be that as, as it may, I'm using in this graph the same graph that we used when we talked about the incidence of a specific tax. If the government wants to move society from this now inefficient outcome to a more efficient outcome, the economist's first response is to impose a tax so that the private marginal cost now reflects the social marginal cost. This, of course, is in an ideal uh, world. We have to know um, what that uh, social cost is. We have to have a certain amount of certainty in setting uh, the, uh, the level of the, of the tax, but we know it's something positive. We know that the costs are not reflected in P-star. It should be something uh, higher. We can also regulate the market through quantities by putting uh, quotas. Um, and so you'll often hear, for example, in markets for pollution, California has this of tradable emissions markets. So these are quotas uh, uh, in which, just like we talked about the agricultural quota, in which we have some sense of what an optimal degree of output uh, is and we allow the market to uh, uh, determine the value of those quotas, and that will restrict the uh, supply at the appropriate level. Um, so I encourage you to, um, to appreciate that government interventions can be both for the good and for the bad. Um, the intuition of our model tends, and I I think I'm going up out a little bit in saying this. Um, economists tend to see the value of the price mechanism. They would rather go with appropriate taxes called the Piguvian taxes, uh, named after Arthur Pigu, who was a student of Alfred Marshall in, in, in the United Kingdom, who first talked about this than to uh, regulate on the side of um, commodities, uh, quantities. Let me give you one example of this. It's a, if I can get this to work, it's a letter written by economists a little more than a year ago, and just as we talked earlier in the course about the important, um, uh, the understanding the important level of consensus amongst economists when it comes to free trade. So you can understand their uh, consensus on carbon pricing. So this was a letter signed by somewhere over 3,500 3, US economists, some very prominent, four former chairs of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the major monetary authority in the United States, so the person who holds this job is probably one of the most influential economists on, on, uh, on Earth. Economists with a very strong academic reputation, having won Nobel Prizes. The economists who were chairpersons of the Council of Economic Advisors, um, which is one of the White House, in, um, one of the president's in-house um, uh, think tanks. And it was published in the Wall Street Journal. And they're arguing for a carbon tax. A carbon tax offers the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at scale and speed that is necessary. By correcting a well-known market failure, a carbon tax will send a powerful price signal that harnesses the invisible hand of the marketplace to steer economic actors towards a lo uh, low-carbon future. So with this tax, you're also sending a signal that you want innovation in this uh, sector that um, that uh, is um, carbon neutral or um, uh, um, uh, uh, will enhance a carbon-free future. They're talking about regular increases in the carbon tax, but it's actually interesting that they are smart enough 
to recognize that efficiency should always be talked about in conjunction with uh, income distribution. To maximize the fairness and political viability of a rising carbon tax, all the revenue should be returned directly to U.S. citizens through equal lump sum rebates. So basically, we're going to impose this tax on a bad in society, and we're going to give it back to people in their income. The price signal has changed. We've changed relative prices, so we've changed behavior. Uh, but now we've increased people's income. If they want, they can continue to go and buy gas-guzzling cars. That'll reflect their preferences with that extra income. But many of them, or some of them, will respond to the price signal and spend their income in other ways. But the point is they are trying to neutralize the distributional consequences of this. We're all going to pay a higher price. That's going to mean someone is going to get some revenue, and it should be the, the, uh, the consumers. So this is a good example of uh, public policy for the benefit through the lens of economics. All right. The book, particularly Unit 12, goes on to talk about goods in more generality and about potential public provision of goods as opposed to just taxation. So I'd read that section. We've been talking about goods that are excludable and rival. So for example, my consumption of the ch chocolate bar. The chocolate bar is a rival good in the sense that if I consume some of it, there is less for the consumption of other people. And it's excludable. I can exclude others from consuming my chocolate bar uh, because I have property rights in it. There are some goods that are uh, not rival, that we consume together. Uh, and these are called, in the extreme, uh, public goods. So my consumption of this good does not take away from your uh, consumption. If I spend an extra hour, hour on um, television, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't spend an extra hour on television. If I go for a walk in the park and enjoy the sunshine, sunshine uh, you can uh, too. Sometimes there is a congestion cost to these goods. So uh, we call them club goods. They're like public goods, but at some point, uh, a certain congestion occurs. Think of, um, think of your tennis club. I mean, I can't play tennis by myself, so I join a club, and it's great to have members. But when the membership gets too large, um, it's harder to get a court, um, uh, and the courts might not be in as good shape because they're used so frequently. Uh, and so there's a certain congestion to these Club goods. But it's in the case of public goods where you have the strongest argument for actual government provision of the good, actually, rather than just sort of changing the uh, price incentives for private uh, uh, provision. Okay. So that concludes our discussion of rent seeking behavior and also of rationales for uh, public intervention. Uh, based upon negative externalities. I'm going to distribute the um, class assignment by email, uh, either later today uh, uh, or uh, early tomorrow. I'm appreciating the fact that some of you are already sending me uh, an email to tell me what books you've chosen. Um, if you do choose this option, please let me know by the latest April 21st. Um, but that's a big deadline for you, April 21st, because you have to also send me your class assignment. I've heard from students, and I'm also feeling it myself, sort of missing uh, having contact with each other and uh, more of a question and a response uh, type of uh, interaction. I've also heard from students uh, with very positive comments on being able to listen to the audio of these um, presentations and also to engage on the website. Um, but if, it would be nice if we could find some way of actually uh, engaging with each other.
So uh, either collectively or small groups, I would like to make the invitation open to all of you if you'd like to have a, a small chat uh, through Skype or, or FaceTime to answer me particular questions. Feel free to do so and we can arrange something uh, uh, at any point this week. And maybe we, when we come back from the break, uh, we can uh, have at least one um, uh, Zoom or other co uh, conference together, but I'm still very uh, much open to your suggestions. And finally, when we do come back after the uh, break, uh, we will start a discussion of, of, of macroeconomics. So once again, thank you very much for your time, uh, your energy, and your attention. And um, even though we're apart, I still feel, and I, I think you do, um, that we're part of a team. And so we'll be soon uh, heading down that final uh, stretch uh, towards the end of the semester. And uh, I do wish all of you uh, uh, a good and happy uh, break and holiday. And of, of course, in these challenging times, uh, to keep safe uh, and take care of yourselves and the ones that you take care of.